There we are. Hey, all right. We are here. We made everybody. It. Uh listen. My name is Chris Albrecht. This is the Open Open Water webinar series and we are talking today about how to write your memoir and we could not have a better guest. Uh this gentleman is James G Robinson. He does many things that he will go into uh including stuff for the New York Times, so you know he's smart. Uh but we are here today because he wrote this book uh, more than we expected. Oh boy, it's out of focus. I promise your copy will be in focus. Um, stupid blurring. Uh, you know, uh, well, first, welcome to the show, James G. Robinson. Thanks, Chris. It's a pleasure to be here. So I, I, it's weird coming up with sort of how to introduce the book because I want to call it wonderful, but it's a heavy subject. So I want to like be ebullient about <laughs> the the book itself with the caveat that I know that it's about a very heavy subject. Can you please uh, just take a moment to introduce yourself and what More Than We Expected is? Sure. My name is James Robinson. I've uh, spent uh, nearly 20 years at the New York Times working behind the scenes on data stuff, uh, helping our journalists understand their audiences. I also teach at Columbia Journalism, and I've also taught at NYU in the past. Um, and I'm also the father of three boys, um, one of whom was uh, born with a very serious congenital heart defect. Um, which was a very devastating thing to know as a parent that that you'd have to have this challenge. Um, uh, but it really opened my eyes to some really remarkable things that I hadn't realized about what it means to be human, what it means to be a parent, um, what it means to have resilience in the face of challenges. And uh, you allude to the fact that it being you know a sad topic uh, because our son died at the age of five, seven years ago. Um, but hopefully if I've written the book right, it's not a sad story. Um, it's really about sort of the wonder that 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 we got to experience um, through quite a remarkable journey, you know, um, that that took us, as you know, around the world and left us stranded in some strange places and and finding our way home. Um, so that's that's a, a summary of me and, and what the book's about. Right. So this book takes place. I mean, it's it is um, it is ultimately a story of uh, hope and happiness uh in the face of adversity um but that adversity went on for a long time so what i wanted to you know i'm not trying to ignore what went on in the book right but what i want to focus sure. on today is just sort of the mechanics of taking all of that life journey and putting it into a book so yes. let's talk about this because as you mentioned like your son was born with a a, a heart uh, issue uh, defect. And this was a process over years, right? That there were struggles and surgeries and all these kinds of things. But as you wrote your book, can you tell me, how were you able to sort of compile all of that in the midst of everything, you know, and, and put together a, a cohesive book? Yeah. I, I think that's a really, a really good question for, for a bunch of reasons. One is like just remembering what happened and getting the narrative right, which is yeah. super important, you know, especially when you work at the times, you know, the real premiums put on making sure that everything is is just so. And although I'm not a working journalist, I sort of felt the obligation to do that. Um, so that's one challenge. And then the other challenge is actually, you know, once you've gone through this really a, a vivid and amazing experience, like having the willpower and the discipline to actually write about it. Um, so, so they're kind of two separate things. Um, in, in terms of like just making sure everything was was right, um, you know, we live in a digital age where where it's it, it, you know, it, it's easy to sort of like, uh, in a very passive way, keep track of things. Um, so one of my questions was like, let's just make sure that everything, I knew when everything happened in the sequence in which things happened. There were things that I had in my memory and I wanted to make sure I had the sequences right and the details right. And we leave this amazing, or certainly we left this amazing paper trail or digital paper trail of emails, text messages, photos, um, just a repository of his life sort of put in amber, which I was able to go back and trigger new memories, make sure that I knew when things happened um, and, and all that. And then also um, I'm, a real, I'm a real pack rat. And so we save like every scrap of paper um, connected to his journey. Um, everything from like menus or business cards from restaurants we ate out on vacation to like medical records and, you know, to try this from the, from the hospital. So I have this amazing archive of our son's life. And one of the things that I did when I decided that I wanted to write it was to actually compile a chronology of, of what happened. And I have a spreadsheet now, like day by day, pretty much of his life and the old things that happened um, there. Um, having the discipline, the willpower to write about it, that's that's a completely different different challenge. Like assembling that into a narrative, especially about such an emotional um, topic could be very challenging, but I also found it to be you know very important and rewarding. And, and it has to be that way because 
it is such an ordeal getting a book published <laughs> that it yeah. has to really, I think, be a story that that you need to tell if your goal is to um, to actually publish a book, and then that may not be um, the ultimate how goal you, of, of writing. Yeah. How did you narrow down? So you had all this material, but how did you narrow down, right? Because you could have chosen, I want to focus on, uh, it, it's weird to say spoiler, right? For a book for yeah. people who read it, but like you spend a, a good chunk of the book is where you're stuck in Australia because- right. Your son, and let's, what was his name? I, I want to make sure that we get his yeah. name correct. His name is Nadav, and he had a medical yeah. emergency while we were on vacation in Australia. And he had a medical emergency. And so mm -hmm. you were stuck in Australia for a long time, right? Yep. But you have all the time up until that point. So you sort of chose to go with his entire life. But I'm wondering, as you were, you had all of these things, were you, how were you, how did you choose, like, well, I'm going to write the entire thing or focus on a specific thing? Or yeah. how did you go about that? Yeah, let let me take a step back and, and take you through like the actual process of writing it, because sure. I think when I actually started writing, I had an inkling that I might write a book, but but my, actually my main motivation when I started writing was not to pay, publish a book. Um, so after our son died, um, my wife and I and the, his two surviving sons decided to take this crazy road trip around the United States. And because I work at the Times and because people there were aware of the situation and knew about this road trip, they're like, well, you should probably write about this. And I'd never been asked to write anything before. So I was like, yeah, sure. You know, that's that's quite an honor. I'll, I'll write about it. And I did. I published a story about our road trip, which was published in the travel section, which was, a, which was quite an achievement. And it was then that I started to realize that other people might be interested in our story because the comments we got as a result of that, like it was clear that our story had triggered something in the audience that sort of resonated with them. And we got these nice notes about, you know, oh, we took a road trip when our son died or, or we, we love camping or there was something resonated with them. And so when we got back from the road trip, I decided I just wanted to like, just keep writing. And so what I did is every night after work, I would go to the quietest place in the New York Times building and I would, um, I would sit down and I'd write a thousand words. So my background's in, in essays. I'm not a working writer, but I do write a lot. I've taught writing at NYU. I teach, you know, writing at, at Columbia. And so I said, I'm just, gonna, I'm just gonna try to get all these memories of our son out of my head and onto the page. And I, it was just for the it was just for the exercise of it. It wasn't like with an eye towards writing a book. So I'd write a thousand words about a particular topic. So, for instance, like hearts or anatomy or um, parking or food or just something music, you know, something connected. And I would just dump all of my memories down on the page. And after a while, I had about thirty or forty of these things, uh, which I was kind of proud of. And somebody said, "Well, that should be a book. Maybe that's a book." So I went out and I started shopping my 30 or 40 essays to agents um, thinking that, you know, it might make an interesting book. And the response from everyone was the same. It was like, the writing's nice, the story's compelling, but uh, you haven't earned the right to write a collection of essays. Apparently that's an honor that's bestowed upon people who have sort of a much more, a much bigger corpus of previously published work. You get to write essays. But one agent said, I'm not going to tell you to do this because it's going to be quite an effort, but this is what you have to do if you want it to be a book. You have to take these disconnected essays and you have to turn them into a narrative. It has to have a beginning, a middle, and an end. And that's going to take a while, but she, think, she thought it was worth doing if I had the energy and stamina for it. And so what I did is I said, I'm going to take this on, see if I can do it. And what I did is I took these 30 or 40 essays. I'd already done this spreadsheet that I talked about with you know, the, all the dates in his life so that I knew what happened on what day. And I chopped every... Um, essay into paragraphs using a piece of software called Scrivener, which is a great, great piece of software to know if you're, um, uh, if you're thinking of writing a book. Um, it was very useful for me because it allowed me to sort of disaggregate these things into paragraphs. And then every paragraph I labeled with the date it happened and I just sorted it chronologically. <laughs> so suddenly all my essays were now just a stream of chronological paragraphs and I just read that through. And when I read it through, it became very, very obvious where the gaps were. Right. If I was going to tell the story of the beginning and middle and an end, what I had was maybe the middle and part of the end. I need to tell the beginning. And so the beginning of the book, as you read it now, the first couple of chapters are about my background in Australia and why Australia is important to me. That was missing from my essays, but it had to be there. So I wrote that through and I started filling in the gaps of, of these essays until it became a complete narrative. And that's when I brought it back to, to agents um, as, a, as a book that they might be more willing to send out a proposal. OK, we're going to get to agents here in a second. But I want yeah. to know, how did you determine what to keep private and what to make public? Um, 
I had told these stories a lot. Like these were things that I was comfortable telling. So when I was writing them down, sometimes it was just writing to noodle through what I really wanted to say. But a lot of the times these were things that I had just a lot of practice in, in telling people about his life. And in fact, one of the reasons I, I felt that, that, that it would resonate with people is after Nadav died, there were a bunch of people at the Times who heard that he had died, did not know me, recognized his name as a Jewish name, and decided to accompany me every day to say the, um, the morning, the mourner's Kaddish every day. And, and I, these were people I did not know. It was just the kindness of them to like accompany me when I went back to work after he died. And every day I would tell them the stories about, about him and our experience. And I got pretty good at telling it. And so, um, so these were things that, that, that I just, I just, I just kind of knew what to tell. So, so I had sort of used spoken language as a gauge for what I felt comfortable sharing and didn't feel comfortable sharing. There are things about his life that are, that are really super compelling and really, really vivid that I left out um, of the book. And, um, and I, they would have made this story, I mean, maybe slightly more powerful, but I didn't need them in there and I wanted to respect his privacy, right? Yeah. Um, there were things about his brothers that I could have included, but I want to respect their privacy because they're young and they're gonna get older. So everything in there, I feel comfortable that they wouldn't mind me sharing. And in some cases, I actually asked our son who was 12 years old at the time, like, is this something you feel comfortable with? And he said, yes. And I just sort of had to dive. I, I always erred on the side of keeping it, keeping it private. And, and I think protecting the people around you is super important in my case. Now, other people write different memoirs, right? Yeah. Family sure. strife. This is not that sort of, sort of memoir. The other thing that I was very careful about is um, there are doctors who are named in the book. And, and I wanted to make sure, some of whom like made difficult decisions and maybe regret some of the decisions that, that you'll read about in the book. And I wanted to make sure they were okay with it too. So I circulated that with them where appropriate and said, are you comfortable with this? And in virtually every case, everybody said, yes, I'm, I'm fine with it. Gotcha. All right. So as people watching are thinking like, oh, I've got a story to tell, right? What would you say, what are the questions people should ask themselves before sort of embarking on a memoir? Yeah. Um, I, I would ask, I'm not huge on advice, but, but this is what I, this is the checklist that I would think through. Um, the first thing I would say is, why are you writing it? Are you writing it primarily for yourself? Or are you writing it for an audience? I think it's an, it's a really important lit, litmus test because you don't need to have something published to write. And writing obviously has a lot of benefits as a private activity, as well as a public activity. So are you writing to understand, to work something out, to vent, you know, like that will dictate when you actually, um, when it comes time to publish it or not publish it, it'll dictate the approach that you take, right? I would say that's mm -hmm. one, one important thing. We can talk about that too, in terms of audience. Yeah. Um, the other thing that I would say is, do you need, do you need to write it? Because in my years teaching, I've come to learn that the most compelling stories come when the writer has like just an urgent need to write something. They can't let it go. They can't shake it. They wake up in the middle of the night. They have to get it down on paper, right? It's yeah. something that's persistently knocking in the back of their brain, right? You must tell this story. And I think the road to publication is so arduous and so stressful and emotional. In some ways, more stressful and emotional and spending five years with a kid with a cardiac heart defect. I'm not kidding. Um, that, that you really have to, you got to be willing to do that and, and endure kind of a lot of emotional ups and downs along the way, um, if, that's, if that's your goal. But, but getting published doesn't have to be your goal. And in fact, I would argue that even if you are published, thinking critically about what success looks like is, is super important. Yeah. What do you think makes for a worthy memoir, right? I think so many times we get wrapped up in the idea that a memoir is about pain or working mm. through pain, right? Or, you know, my dad didn't love me or whatever, right? Like it seems like, but that I think that's a very limiting view. And I think one of the things, you know, your book obviously deals with pain, but it, it did so, I think, in a very uh, different way, right? Like it did so, it was kind of celebratory and mournful at the same time. And I'm just curious as for you, like as people think about memoirs, right? Like they may only think in a very sort of this, you know, one track going yeah. forward. But what do you think makes for a worthy memoir? 
I think, and this extends to all published writing, it's in the service of the reader. It, it, you, are, you are giving something to the reader, you are offering something to the reader, which is a value to the reader. And a memoir that is purely self-indulgent or for yourself can be compelling to readers, but oftentimes it's, it's not, right? Um, I think there has, to be, there has to be something in it that the reader can take away and apply to their own experience or something that resonates with their own experience that helps them look at the world, hopefully in a slightly different way and, and, and enriches their, experience, their human experience, right? In, in this sort of genre, I've read yeah. plenty of fun memoirs, which are not deep or, you know, they're just yeah. fun reads. Somebody was like, well, you have to read, there's this heavy metal band, which I'll never, I, I don't think I've ever listened to their music, but like, you have to read this because the stories are just insane, right? You're not going to look at yeah. that for life. It's purely entertainment, but certainly in the genre that I'm talking about, which is, which deals with heavy topics like grief. Um, it, it, it can be hard. And I've read memoirs like this to, to spend hours of your life with somebody who's bitter and angry. Right. If it's not for a purpose and 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 those maybe for me are less valuable than the things that sort of offer me a different way of looking at the world. OK, so. People have an idea, they're jotting things down, they're assembling them, right, they're writing them. Yep. Uh, what is sort of, you know, before we get to the publication, what was your editing process, right? editing process like right because you have it writing is rewriting so i yeah. assume that as you wrote it the first time was not what ended up in the book and what was your process for that did you show it to like family and friends first and then take their feedback or how did you go about that yeah i would say the best parts of the book are actually things that, that aren't overly edited i think that a lot comes on it, it can if you overly workshop and this is something i experienced with my students at columbia if you overly workshop something it takes a lot of the joy and the, and the, and the spontaneity out of it but in terms of my editing process, um, the first person I showed everything to, all the way back to essays, was my wife, Tali, mm -hmm. because um, she is not a writer or an editor, but she's super smart. She remembers different things about our experience that I may have forgotten. She's very fastidious about details. Um, in another life, she would make an amazing New York Times copy editor, actually, um, not just for grammar, but also for fact checking. Um, and, and the thing that's remarkable about her is th this is a story that she would never tell, um, from her perspective, but I do kind of tell it from her perspective. And, and, and what was nice about, uh, about her is she's like, well, this is a story you need to tell. And I respect that. I'm going to help you tell it, even though it's not a story that I would tell. So she was able to look at it in, in, I think the way that the best editors have empathy for the writer and they're trying to help the writer find their voice. She had that for me. Right. Um, so I think it's really important to have a first reader who has that sort of empathy and is not trying to like steer you or wrestle you into what they want the book today. I think virtually every stage of the editing process. Um, I hired two editors during the drafting of it. The first to help me think through some of the essays and some of the connective tissues between the essays. And then the other one after I'd done this whole chopping exercise and look at the narrative. Um, and they um, weren't cheap, but they were worth it. Um, I, I'm, firm, I'm a firm believer in paying people what they're worth because kind of get what you pay for. And um, they really offered critical perspectives on sort of like what was appealing from the reader's viewpoint about the story. One of the, one of the cool things about publishing a book is you get to see your story through other people's eyes and they focus on things that are different than what you expect. There's a part of our story where we spend six months in a hospital, for example, wait, trying to get rid of this like persistent medical problem. And to me, when I was writing it, it was like the most boring thing in the world. It's like, nobody's going to want to spend six months in the hospital with us. And it turns out since I published it, that a lot of parents really find that fascinating, hmm. which was news to me. And the, and the best editors will sort of point those moments out, like, don't lose that. And they'll also say, you know, you're rambling a little bit here. You know, you, you're a little too gilded. So, um, so that was good. And then when I had a finished draft, I, I shared it with one here who I really trust, who's also writing a memoir. A very good memoir actually it's not been published yet and i just wanted to get his take on it but to be honest with you i just want him to tell me it was good you yeah. know and this is like the neurosis that every writer feels like is it good is it good yeah. is it good is it good and he said it was good and that he kind of did his job you know and the piece of feedback that he gave me i made a little edit i kind of regretted it it was fine but i just needed that reassurance and that reinforcement which is no small thing because it's a very lonely exercise writing and publishing a book as well. All right. So you've written it down. You've gotten it mm -hmm. edited. Now it's time to go to publishers. Tell me. No, you what haven't is helped it me like... find an agent yet. Chris, yeah, oh, we haven't sorry. found an agent yet. 
Well, that's part of the process, right? Because you could, oh. and we'll get to that in a second, right? Like you could. Okay, just, I'm sorry. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Could you could sell it as like, no, no, I'm not trying to argue, but like, <laughs> it, you're right, absolutely. And, you know, we're in an age where you could just publish it on your own. You could you put it up on Kindle Unlimited or something like that, but you went through an agent, right? So tell me about yeah. the process of finding an agent. Okay, 100%. You can publish this at any point. We live in a golden era for writers, maybe not so for publishers. But for writers, there are no shortage of platforms for you to be published on. And I think there is sort of like a glamour attached to like being published by a large imprint or a big publishing house. And I think as a writer, if you've done that work of saying, why am I writing this? You may want to get over that. And, and like publishing it on your own may be just fine, right? And it doesn't mean your work is any less good or, you know, because there one thing you'll find as I've described the process is there are gatekeepers at every step. and they may not have empathy for the sort of outcomes or the sort of success that you want, right? Everybody has a different definition of success. So part of my definition of success is I did want to reach an audience. I did want to be with a, a publisher. I did want to have kind of like an imprint. I wanted distribution. Like I wanted all those things. I didn't want to kind of do all those things by myself. Although I always kind of was intrigued by it because I'm sort of in the business of digital stuff. I was intrigued by it. what if I put it on Substack and like release a chapter every week? I still yeah. think that would be a really cool exercise and see if you can grow an audience that way. I think that'd be a lot of fun. But yeah. I would I would have kicked myself if I hadn't at least tried to get an agent. So, um, so yes, I had these agents who I'd spoken to before, um, who I'd shown the essays to. One of them I felt a real affinity for. And I was like, I'm going to give her right of first refusal because I think she's a great fit. So I sent her the thing and she said, immediately, she said like, thanks for sending it over. I'll be right back to you. I'll get back to you as soon as I can, right? And by giving her sort of first rights, I sort of given her a clues a little bit. Well, I waited. I waited and I waited two weeks and I waited four weeks and I waited six weeks and I waited three months. I waited for this woman to get back to me. She did not get back to me. She completely ghosted me. Yeah. And it was an infuriating waste of half a year of my time and the emotional roller coaster of being like pins and needles waiting for somebody to say up or down is the worst part of publishing. And this was my first experience with it. Right. Eventually I cut bait. I sent her a note and I'm like, I'm showing it to other people. I'm sorry. I can't wait anymore. Which is a hard thing to do because this is a person who you think really values your work and agents are like hard to get. Yeah. Right. Um, and I, and I, I sent it to somebody else and, and <laughs> one of the, well, I sent a few other people and one of them called back and I didn't done like a little proposal as well. Cause you have to do a book proposal. Right. Even for a nonfiction, you have to do a proposal, even if you have a full manuscript. And she said, well, the proposal, she started ripping my proposal to stretch. She's like, publishers aren't interested in this paragraph and they want to see more of this. And da, 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 da. About 20 minutes of ripping it to bits. And then she said, um, my heart sank. And then she said, well, um, yeah, when we send it out, we're going to fix all these things. I'm like, wait, what now? And she's like, yeah. And I said, are you are you taking this on? She said, 100 percent. I totally believe in this book. And I was like, that's great. I was like, what's the next step? She's like, well, I've given you my critique. So make those changes and we'll get on, right on it. And I hadn't listened to a word she'd said. Because <laughs> the whole thing was just like, are you saying it? You know? <laughs> anyway, she's great. She believed in birth. It only takes one person. It's a cliche, but it's true. It only takes one person. And for a book like this, you really have to believe in it. Because a book about a, a book where a child dies is a tough sell. And um, she believed... Not that it would be a bestseller. She believed that there were people who needed to read this. And she was on board with helping me find those people. And and that was a big thing. And we'll get to talking about success later. But but I think that's a, a really important part of this calculus. So that's my story of landing an agent. Okay. So you land an agent. Now yep. you're on to getting something published. So how many, how much time has elapsed from when you started to now going out to publishers? I have done the math. It took me longer to find an agent and a publisher than it took me to write the book. And it took me a long time to write the book. Yeah, it took six years from writing those first essays to actually having the book in my hands, and about half of those years was writing it, and about half of the years was actually getting it published. Wow! So yeah, in, because the insane. agent now goes around and shops it for you, right? Yeah, you got to buff up the proposal. You got to make sure the proposal right. You got to get, you know, like the synopsis right, the bio right. You got to get the comps right. To make sure that the books comp to the right other books. Um, I probably did a no no. I comp my book to like great books of the past like death be not proud or uh, you know c.s yeah. lewis on grief and when good things happen to bad people because i thought it was like not because i was being pompous but i thought like these were the best comparisons and they weren't really similar comparisons anyway 
she goes out a proposal and her guidance is you've got to send it to the big publishers first and you've got to send it to all the imprints at the same time. So we sent it to 35 imprints for the big five publishers. And that took probably about a month, a month and a half, two months to get all the signal back. And every single one said no. And they all said some version of the same thing. And she shared that feedback with me, which I had asked for. And she was a little hesitant to do it, but I wanted to see it because I wanted to see what their take was. And their take was the book is beautifully written, but we don't see it as a breakout hit. And what they were saying as a breakout is they don't see it as a bestseller because publishers are really looking for like hits. Yeah. Right. And I think the, the topic of, of a child who dies was kind of a showstopper for them. Um, and one person actually had lost out on an auction. One editor had lost out on an auction 10 years before on a similar book. And although he was devastated at the time, in retrospect, he was happy, he said, because it would have broken his heart to spend that much time on a book he cared about and seen it sold few, so few copies. <laughs> so this is like punches to my, these are body blows to me right now, because, you know, you dream of this happening and, and and all the while it's an emotional roller coaster. It's really ups and downs and ups and downs and ups and downs the whole way. Then she said, "Well, all of them said no. Should we send it out for a second round with like smaller publishers or independent publishers?" And I was like, "Sure. Well, why would you say no?" She said, "Well, some people say no." I said, "I'm not going to say no. Let's say yes." As he sent it to 15 small publishers, and 14 of them said no, and one of them asked, "When can you have the manuscript ready?" And that was my publisher, Post Hill Press, and my amazing editor, Debbie Englund. And um, they took a chance on it. So, so that was a great, that was a great. That's great. Deal. But I think yeah. sort of the lesson here people should understand is that writing the book isn't the only arduous process in creating a memoir. Well, it, it, it is not if you want it to be published as a traditional sure. book. Right? Okay. Which, which I think is increasingly is one of many options. Right, because there are so you could, you know, you self publish on Amazon, like you said, mm -hmm. you could create it as a sub stack. But I think to your point, too, if people spend it like they just want that validation, right? Like I was good enough to get published, and that, you know, because anybody can create a PDF and Xerox copies, right? But if somebody else comes in and says, Yes, we think this is good, it offers a certain level of like not even like commendation, but just validation. Yes. So that is super, super important. And my work at the Times for the past 20 years has really been about using data to understand audiences. And a lot of that is defining success. What does success look like? And I think this is a super, super important step, even from the beginning of the writing process, to understand what does success look like to you, right? Um, and that I think anybody who wants to be published does want validation. They want to know that their work is valued by other people, right? And that can be any sort of other people. It could be a mass audience. It could be a certain type of reader. It could be the New York, the staff of the New York Times Book Review. It could be the board of the Pulitzer Committee, right? Like these are all people who, who are standing in judgment and the worst parts to be ignored, right? There's crickets. Um, but it doesn't have to be all of those things. And I decided early on in this process, that the way I would define success is there were four groups of readers that I really wanted to reach. And if this book spoke to them, um, then I would consider that to be a success. And so that was a lens by which I viewed success. I have not won a Pulitzer Prize. Um, I did nominate myself for a Pulitzer Prize because if you send in a few dollars, you can nominate yourself. And I was like, what the heck? This is my one lottery ticket of my life to win a Pulitzer Prize. I'm going to go for it. I did not win it. Um, I have not yet been reviewed by the New York Times Book Review, but the company I work for, which is a little weird, but that's cool. Um, and again, like, I didn't write it for the editors in the New York Times Book Review. I wrote it for four types of people. I wrote it for parents. I wrote it for people who are experiencing grief. I wrote it for people of faith. And I wrote it for people in the medical community. And so my approach has been, since we published it, is try to reach those audiences um, and, and not just sell tons of copies in each of those worlds, but actually um, engage in a, in a conversation where hopefully our experience can help those people deal with whatever they're dealing with in that particular community. Sure. Um, and so that, that gives me a certain amount of comfort. That's great. That, I mean, it's, yeah. I think it's good. Happiness comes from setting proper expectations, right? And mm -hmm. so if you are honest with yourself about what your expectations are, then, you know, you're going to be able to at least navigate within that. Yeah, I would just say that the validation doesn't have to be the big prize or the big bestseller. The validation can be one person writing in and saying, this book, book spoke to me. And, and, and it really is true. Yeah. 
All right. Uh, I want to. I want to open it. If people have any questions in the audience, they can email or not email. <laughs> yes, and uh, submit the question right, and I will ask it through the Q and A. Send a self-addressed stamped envelope. Yes, please to Pueblo, Colorado. Um, for those old enough to remember those ads. Um, all right. So you teach a course in writing, and I want to know what is something you teach your students about the process, right? Now, it doesn't even have to be about memoir writing, right? Like, it's just, what is something that you teach uh, your students? So I co-teach a class in long-form narrative nonfiction in which students report, write, and then publish their own stories as a book within three months. And I've mm -hmm. told you, for me, it took six years. So the fact that they do it in three months is actually remarkable. Um, I tell them a few things. I tell them, uh, similar to what I just told you, I think understanding the audience that you're writing for and what success looks like is super important. And I also tell them that from the first day of class that they are running out of time because everything in publishing takes a long, long, long time, whether it is finding an agent, getting responses from a draft, hearing from publishers, waiting for the cover design or the title, or then when's the whole proof to actually get it in somebody's hands. Everything takes a long time. Um, and during that time, as the author, you're very emotionally vulnerable. And so knowing, having a sense that it will take a while and being at peace with the fact that you're going to have to sort of have some inner self-strength or coping mechanism to deal with the emotional tribulations of publishing is really super important. Interesting. All right. So what uh, for people who are interested in, right, oh, we got a question. Hold on one second, please, while I look this up. Do you, okay, this is a question uh, from Andrea. What do you think is the public's overall interest in hiring a qualified writer to write a family member's memoirs? To write somebody, sorry, I missed. So the, I would imagine this, the, this is the way this is framed as I understand it is like, you know, if you want to write a family, if your family wants to write uh, a memoir, but you don't want to go through the time of writing it, but hiring someone presumably to come in and do interviews and then put all that together, do you think that there's something viable there? Yeah, I mean, I think again, yeah, I think, I think again, like the question is like, to what end? We actually, in our family, you know, my somebody wrote a memoir about my grandfather, um, who's a remarkable person. And it wasn't meant to be a bestseller, it was meant to be a family heirloom. And we hired somebody to write it and they did a really good job of capturing him, but it's not the sort of book that we're gonna go out and you know, put in airport bookstores all over America, right? Um, or Australia, because he's Australian. Um, I, I think that's one example that I've seen of, of sort of like hiring somebody to write a family memoir. I think if, if, if you think that there's a compelling story to be told, but you, you know, you may not be the person to tell it, I think there's avenues to explore that. But I, I don't have any experience really with that sort of dynamic. I know my colleagues at the Times journalists are always on the look for great stories. And a lot of my fellow journalists have written amazing family histories, but I don't know whether that was triggered by the family or whether the reporter, I don't know the backstory enough of those to, to give any solid advice about how to make those, those things happen. Well, I do know that there's something like story worth that's out there where they will mm -hmm. prompt. Uh, I just got that from my mother, actually. Uh, I just heard about of... that today for the first time my aunt is doing that just yeah, half an hour yeah. ago. Yeah. So, and you can, you at the end, you can compile all your answers into a book and then, Hey, look at that. You got a book. Um, so, you know, that I think might usurp some of that uh, capacity for, depending on how much that takes off, um, you know, if you have something that can just prompt you into doing it, but I also, people are lazy and writing is hard. And so if you can get someone else to do it, uh, they, they it definitely can. is hard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, as we, as we sort of wrap up here, I want to know, do you, so you teach, you co-teach a writing, uh, uh, class, but are there mm -hmm. some writing programs that people might want to investigate that help them with their writing journey that you know of? Uh, not off the top of, not the top of my head. I can do a little research into it. Um, I do think that even if you are an accomplished writer, finding a good editor is really a necessary step. And that can be through a publishing house, but it can also um, be on your own. And if you are serious about it, then it can be a real worthwhile investment. Um, and what because do you look for this ed editor to do? Are they just going like, this doesn't make sense. This should right. be so here. What are they doing? Yeah, so there's different types that you have to be careful about this because there are different types of editors, copy editors who are making sure that your, your punctuation is the right place and everything's spelled properly and the sentences have yeah. a subject and object and a verb, right? Oh. 
but I think I think in the more like um, creative stages, um, there are people who can help craft the story and think through like what is the story that you're trying to tell, because the story really has to come before the words. You know, if you don't have like a compelling story that says like what is the nagging question that you're trying to answer or what is the real insight that you're trying to deliver, um, the words can sometimes get in the way of that actually, and and like mm -hmm. writing scenes before you really know the purpose of those scenes. Um, is is sometimes a little premature and, and in fact i sort of got a lot of that system with with the, the essays that i had written but but as i started to assemble them into a piece of whole what i really found more so than the actual words that i'd written it was like what is this book about right and and i learned a lot about like what is the core of this book and the story i'm trying to tell and the hinge that it's that it's swinging on by taking a step back from the writing and thinking through like what is the underlying message here and a good editor or a good peer will help you think that through and it's something at a book level that really has to hap happen for the, sort of, to carry your interest through 300 pages right or 80,000 words um, if you're writing an essay you can kind of get away with like a collection of scenes that maybe have an interesting ghost of an idea in it but if you're going to tell a story there, there has to be a cohesiveness to, to the narrative in, in the service of an idea that a good sure. editor will help you think through. Yeah. Uh, Nancy Wright uh, wrote in as basically said, I feel like I have a compelling story to write about my deceased husband, but I'm tangled up in how much of my emotions I want to share. Mm. The book could be about everything he went through and everything I went through. And she also, uh, BTW, I attended your book uh, talk in Scotch Plains. Oh, good. nice to see so. you. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that gets to the, the what we were talking about earlier, right? Like, how do you self-edit before you just, if your story is about everything, it's about nothing, right? Yeah, I think also you have to be willing to be honest. And I'm not saying, I'm not implying that the author here is deceitful, right? But 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 knowing how much you're willing to share is really, I think, an important decision point in, in the process here. The things that I didn't share are, are like details or minor details. I'm pretty honest about what it is like to hold your dead son in your arms you know like i was willing to go there because i think it's important and i think it's important not just because it's going to make you cry but also because it's going to make you feel and make you learn yeah. right and if i was not comfortable sharing that i don't know if the book would be as meaningful or as powerful that is not to say that you have to dump feel you have to dump your whole life history we talked earlier about the things that you keep hidden but i do think you need to be you know a book about how, how great somebody is is not like a great story it might be a wonderful tribute but unless there's that tension there, um, uh, it, it, for the reader, it's going to be less compelling. For us, our decision to go to Australia, a decision which left us stranded in a foreign country with our son clinging to life is the hinge of the story, right? right. And, and, and really confronting that head on and asking the question, was that the right decision, is permeated throughout the book. If I was not willing to ask that question or sort of like put myself, my neck on the line, because I'm sure a lot of people reading, especially doctors, are going to read this book and be like, are they crazy? And if you read the book, hopefully you'll realize we weren't crazy. I don't think we were crazy, but I have to confront that question without it, the story. I'm hiding something important from the reader. So I have to be willing right. to go there. Yep. Right. All right. Well, James G. Robinson, you are the author of more than, I'm going to hold over my face so that people can see the cover <laughs> and it, it comes in focus there. Uh, this has been a really wonderful and insightful chat. Thank you for writing this book. Everybody should go uh, get it, whether it's through Amazon or bookshop, whatever it is, dot org. Uh, please um, take a look and read it. Uh, and it's yeah, a really website wonderful is, story. Thank you. The I'm website sorry? is more the website is more than a memoir dot com where you can see um, all sorts of information about it. More than a memoir dot com. James Robinson, you are an author, a data person at the New York Times, and you co-teach a class at Columbia. Thank you so much for sharing all of your uh, insight and wisdom with us today. Thanks, Chris.